Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Natalie Cook, Professor and Associate Dean of the McGill University Library. And I'm sorry we're unable to be together in person because I know it would be really enjoyable. But it's still a delight to be able to welcome folks not only from Montreal, but from much farther away who probably wouldn't have had the chance to join us on campus. A special welcome to those of, in our Play On 2020 series of events, which in part focuses on creating moments of wonder and opportunities for play with our wonderful, rare and special collections. You know, over the past few months, the raw configuration of units for which I'm responsible has been thinking of innovative strategies to engage the public in virtual formats. It's a reality and a challenge that many of us are facing at the moment. But as we hope you'll agree when you join us for this and other play on series events, this virtual space allows us to connect with material and viewers in innovative ways and proves that primary sources can provide moments of wonder in virtual as well as physical form. Now, it's my absolute pleasure today um, to introduce two of my dear colleagues, actually. But first of all, let me introduce Erin Hurley, who is coming to you as a professor in the Department of English and who specializes in drama and specifically Quebec drama. Over to you, Erin, to introduce our speaker today. Thanks very much, Natalie. Welcome all. Um, it's a delight and a pleasure and an honor to introduce Catherine Bradley, whose work as a costume designer, which she's going to tell us about today, um, is superbly apropos of this series that Roar has put together on uh, serious play. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Catherine. In addition to being a wonderful person, she is the resident costume designer and head of wardrobe at McGill University, where she teaches the courses Costuming 1 and 2, and also the history of costume. She began her career working on costumes in many of the major, major Canadian theatres, including the Stratford and Shaw Festivals, the National Ballet, the National Arts Centre, Banff, etc. She's designed costumes for a gamut of different kinds of productions, ranging from the classics, like the Greek classics, Aeschylus, uh, to other kinds of classics, Shakespeare and Goldoni, to newly developed scripts and collective creations or devised works. Bradley remains connected to the industry through freelance millinery, so hat making, uh, costume confection and wardrobe management, as well as creating open access educational materials. And I just want to mention um, two of these. So she's worked in the past with digital illustration and digital textile design. Um, and these projects include the digital textiles project and the virtual textile project. Um, and so with no further ado, it's over to you, Catherine. I'm looking forward to hearing you. Thank you so much. Thank you both, Nathalie and and Aaron. I am really happy to be here today. And as Nathalie th says, this does give us an opportunity to share a little more widely with students, past, present, and future, as well as colleagues around the globe. So this is a lovely opportunity. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start by sharing a little bit about why I'm here and how how my work connects with um, with the library's program. So let's just take a little look. Um, Nathalie put together with the great collaboration of Roar, the Play On lecture series. And in fact, it's much larger than just a lecture series. And the idea behind it, and I'm quoting here, is supporting the presence of serious play in higher education through creativity, innovation, and cooperation in new forms of immersive intellectual engagement. Well, I cannot agree more that costuming is exactly that. Just that whole idea of creating and innovating and incredible cooperation, not just within the costume shop, but with, the, with all of the different aspects of putting on a play together. So indeed, it exactly, exactly fits the bill. So thank you for inviting me to speak on this. 
I'm also going to, I cannot uh, miss out on the opportunity to show you a little bit about the McGill costume shop. And here are my students, the students that make it all worthwhile. So, um, different students working on sewing. Um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes in between sewing, we have a little laugh as well. Um, do fittings, we've we're hand sewing, as well as we have a dye room. We have students that are working on uh, fabric techniquing, as well as applique. So you can see that there are so many things that we do, and I couldn't possibly show you these costumes without really um, recognizing the fact that yes, I may be the 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 ringleader in this circus, but my students are really, uh, they're really the ones who make sure that everything happens. So we're going to look at um, playing dress up, demystifying costume design. And I think when most people think of costumes, they think of period costumes. And indeed, that is something that we've done a lot of at McGill. Um, I just have a few different shows, uh, productions that I'd like to show you right now. The first one being The Importance of Being Earnest, which was directed by Myrna Wyatt Selkirk. And this one depicts the late Victorian era. And here are just a few examples of the costumes that my students made. And yes, they made the suits, the hats, the everything. Um, and here's an example as Erin mentioned, I'm a little bit partial to millinery work. So this is something that one of my students did, and here's the design for it as well. And this design speaks to what Erin was talking about in terms of the digital costume project. So you can see that the image of the actor who happens to be Jess Hill, who was a wonderful, wonderful student with us, and is now at Stratford. So I'm really, really happy for her. She's very deserving. So it, it's taking Jess's own face and we're building the illustration around the actual actor so that it suits the proportions and that we can really plan exactly as we're making the costume. The other thing that's really important when we're working on period costumes is all of the underpinnings. So the corsets, the petticoats, if any of my history of costume students are out there, this is what it's all about. It's about creating the structure that is going to support the costume. And without that structure, there is no accuracy in a period costume. Here's another period play that we worked on. This one set a little bit later, uh, Blood Relations. And this one was directed by Sean Carney. And this one set a few years later in the 1880s, 1890s. And again, you can see that when we're working on period costumes, we're tending towards more realism. We are trying as much as possible to rely on actual sources, which anyone will be pleased to know that you can find in the archives at your libraries, in museum archives. It really ties in with research, research as your as your best tool when you're working on period costumes. We use things like uh, Eaton's catalogs from, from 1888, uh, also things like Godey's Ladies Book, the various periodicals, even Harper's Bazaar was existent at the time. So all of these costumes that you see were lovingly made by my students. And I also wanna shout out to um, Corin Dealey and Keith Roach, who are in charge of the stage scenery and lighting class. And they and their students together made this beautiful set. And you can see that as we're working on more realistic details in costumes, there are also more realistic details of actual furniture, a real staircase working up to a second floor, even the turned balusters and, and all of that woodwork, as well as stenciled wallpaper, all of those beautiful details that work together to create that world with period costumes. Here's another 
image of the same ladies that you saw peeking through the doorway in the last shot. And the other thing that we need to think about as we're working on period costumes is we need to think about the long skirts, skirts with trains as these were, and how the actors can move and manipulate these types of clothing that they are not used to at the beginning. So what we try to do is get long skirts in rehearsal right from the beginning, get corsets in rehearsal as quickly as we can and get the actual shoes and boots in rehearsal so that the actors can acclimatize to wearing clothing that's essentially quite different from what they normally do. So aside from that little overview of period costumes, which I think is most people sort of default when they're thinking about costuming. I want to go through my own personal design process. It's everyone has their own process. This just happens to be mine. So I start with the script and no, I'm not just saying that because this is the library's uh, sponsored lecture. This is genuinely indeed where I always start. I try to make sure that I'm not influenced by uh, films or other people's productions. I try to start exactly with the script and find out what's the best way that I can illustrate that script. I see it as as though it's a children's book and I am drawing the pictures to illustrate the text in a children's book. Sometimes when you're working on King Lear, the illustrations are a little bit more um, disturbing than in a children's book, but nonetheless. So um, once I've got the script down, for me, color palette is the huge, huge important thing. So let's look at the color palette for a particular show that my students and I designed. It's called Blue Planet, and it's uh, written by Andre Snare Magnuson and was directed by Myrna Wyatt Selkirk, who's a dear colleague of all of ours. And as you look at this color palette, you can tell right away that there's something going on that's very in your face and it's a children's play. You would not be surprised to know. So let's just take a look at the children of the light over here and you'll see that we are defining different areas, different locations by the colors that are associated with the different groups. So the children of the light have these really bright sort of carefree colors. And then there was a challenge that we faced, which is this, these three characters called Jolly Good Day. Jolly Good Day, we envisioned them as uh, intergalactic used car salesmen. They come, they're trying to get something out of the children, and they are just so bright and vibrant and bold. And it was a bit of a challenge because we wanted the children themselves, the children of the light, we wanted them to be bright and vibrant and bold. But then how do you top that and have Jolly Good Day be even brighter and bolder? And what I did in the color samples here is I mixed a hot pink and a hot orange. And in Jolly Good Day's green, I mixed uh, a teal blue, a very vibrant blue, with a vibrant green. And just that juxtaposition of colors that make your eye vibrate, and I apologize for the fact that when you're looking at them on the screen right now, they may be making your eye vibrate right now, but just that juxtaposition of colors gives that sense uh, visually of more impact. And then we had forest creatures that included trees and, and spiders and all that sort of thing. For those, we wanted them to blend into the background, so that made complete sense. And then we have the children of the dark. And I was really, really um, impressed by my students as we were discussing the color palette, because they came up with the idea that the children of the dark shouldn't just be dark, which I think, 99% of people would think. Um, someone came up with the idea that they should actually be light and white. And they were thinking of things like mushrooms and things that grow without light in the forest. So I thought that was a brilliant idea. So let's take a look at what comes next. Next, what we do is we actually choose the fabrics that reflect those colors. And you can see that some of the fabrics 
that were in the same palette. Some of them change a little bit because of what's available out there in the market. But I just want to draw your attention to this one right here, which was Jolly Good Day. And do you remember how I had mentioned that we get that sort of vibrancy by the bright orange and the bright pink fighting with each other and being placed right beside each other? And that's actually, uh, we were quite lucky and we found something that really fought the good fight. So let's take a look at how we take the color palette and then we apply it to the show. For me, the color palette is the biggest way of organizing a show and knowing what to do with a show. I think other people may start in different places, but for me, the color is the big thing. So you will probably not be surprised when I tell you that these children over here in the pinks and oranges and yellows and purple, those are the children of the light. And these characters over here are the character called Jolly Good Day. I'm just going to briefly say that my colleague Myrna likes to triple actors every once in a while. So these three people are one person and you just love it and, and embrace it. That's just the way it is. So you will notice that the Jolly Good Days stand out in a different way from the children because of the prints that they're wearing. And the other thing that's interesting to look at here is these same colors are carried into the background as well. And the, the premise of a children's illustration or almost like cutouts, as though it was cardboard cutouts, was carried forward into the set. And um, my colleagues who work on the set are really, really um, very talented and uh, especially um, in terms of lighting design and all of those extra elements that come into a strong set design, a strong presence on stage. So let's take a look at how the forest creatures fit in. Now, of course, you can see right here that we've, well, I say of course, maybe it's because I know the show quite well. These characters in the middle are the spider characters, but I'm also going to point out some characters that you can almost not see. There's a tree. This is actually an actor who's a character playing a tree. There's a hyena over in the corner here. There's another tree character over here and another tree character over here. And what's interesting about this sort of purposeful placement of dark colors in dark environments is that it almost creates this kind of peekaboo effect where you don't see the hyena and then all of a sudden oof, he comes out of the woods. So it's purposeful the way that they're sort of, you can see them when they're in the light, but they're hidden when they're a little bit more in the darkness. And oh, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty. So I'm going to ask that I, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and my colleague is going to start sharing her screen. So I believe possibly Jacqueline is about to start sharing her screen. And I'll just talk to you a little bit while we wait for Jacqueline. Jacqueline is going to uh, bring the PowerPoint back up. We realized that this was a very heavy PowerPoint because I was ambitious in terms of the amount of photographs that I was putting in it. Um, I really, really wanted to show you everything. So it may take a little moment while Jacqueline gets the PowerPoint back up, but while she does that, I am going to just talk to you a little bit more about the way in which we use the color palette. Ah, there we go. We are sharing screen. And if someone can just confirm for me that the audience can see the screen in full size, that would be great. I'm going to I'm going to pretend that I know that you do and I'm sure that all will be well. And if not, We'll get that figured out. Oh, I've got a yes, and thank you so much. All right, so um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. And in this slide, we can see the children of the dark. This one, um, you see these shadowy white figures in the background, the white and light figures. And this is just showing you um, how 
how effective that decision was. And in fact, if we had not made those characters be light and white, it's entirely possible that we wouldn't have been able to see them at all. We'll go to the next slide. And in the next slide, we're going to see the ways in which the color is not just something that happens in the costumes. It's something that is echoed and supported in the lighting design as well. So all of those colors, those bright yellows and oranges and fuchsias and purples, you see how our lighting designer, Keith Roche, has uh, reflected those into the big picture. We'll go to the next slide. Thank you. And in our next section that I want to look at together, I'm calling it color coding the teams. We can go to the next slide now. And this one is Midsummer Night's Dream. It's directed by Sean Carney. And of course, you know that it's William Shakespeare. So in the first slide, we're seeing the Athenians. And the color palette that we did for the Athenians has these bronzes and brasses as well as uh, um, as well as the creams and a little bit of orange and we'll go to the next slide and I'll show you even a bigger view oh we're coming back thank you very much I know I get the Trixie slides as well that hop around <laughs> they hop around as they wish so we're going to tame those slides um, so as you see we've got the creams We've got the bronzes and we've got a tiny little bit of blue that you're seeing peeking out in a couple of different places. We we'll go to the next slide. For those of you that are familiar with Midsummer Night's Dream, you'll know that there's kind of a humorous little rustic collection. A lot of people call them the mechanicals. It's um, the sort of the field, the field workers and and uh, hand laborers who want to put on a play. And we've taken those same colors that we used in Athens, but we are defining the team a little bit more widely now. And these characters have the same color palette, but it's just intensified. And you'll notice that we snuck in that blue again. In this case, it's sort of a teal blue and a little bit of navy as well. And as we look at the next slide, we'll see what my purpose was for bringing in the, the sort of blues and the greens and having it all live harmoniously together. So these, of course, are the, the fairies in the forest. And you'll see that that blue green is now the, the kind of crucial element. It's the thing that sings in the frame. So we've intensified that blue and you can't see it on the on the image here, but there are some little tiny sparkles that are sewn onto the blue crystallette so that when she moves, you actually see almost like a little dewdrop glistening feel. Um, it's a clear sparkle, which I, I highly recommend a clear sparkle if you just want that sense of, ooh, I don't know where that glistening is coming from. It's not, um, it's not like the big sort of Vegas showgirl sparkles, but it's really, really effective. We'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, we seem to be having a little bit of technical difficulty with that next slide. Um, so I think I'll just talk for a little bit about this slide until we're able to shift to the next slide, because that would be great when we can. So actually, this is something I had wanted to talk about anyways, is um, my colleague Corin Dealey designed this set. So actually, I'm glad that we had a little glitch on the slide. Uh, she designed this set and it has those beautiful, beautiful uh, textures in the set. And you'll notice that they kind of echo the textures that were in um, that were in the Athenian costumes. It looks like right now we're having a little more <laughs> technical difficulty and that's okay because it gives me a chance to just chat with you so that is totally totally fine um when working on costumes 
it's something that is so much of a collaborative, it's a collaborative sport. So we're going to look now at visualizing transformation. For me, that idea of transformation is really important. And we're gonna look at it in the context of Tartuffe by Moliere, and it was directed by Coral Thieu. So let's take a look at the first slide for Tartuffe and visualizing transformation, if possible. Um, I'll also let you know that for me, this idea of transformation, it's something that happens very, very often in a play. There will be characters who go on a journey that's a, a personal journey. Sometimes it's an emotional journey or even an, an intellectual journey. It's not necessarily an actual geographic voyage. But for me as a costume designer, I'm really interested in taking that internal journey and that internal transformation and making that apparent on the outside. And that I think is what really interesting costume design can do. So as we start Tartuffe, we see um, a very elegant ballroom. There's a minuet playing and in, as we get a little bit closer up to the um, to the characters, we see that there's this extreme opulence that's going on in in the household. And this character here, the, with the sort of hot pink skirt, is Elmire. She is the the woman of the house. And at the beginning of the play, she and her husband Orgon are the ones who hold the power. They are the important people in the household. And for those of you that know the play Tartuffe, you'll also know that they go through transformation. There is a change that happens from the lovely, beautiful family with everything. And at the end, the power is actually sucked away from them and it's sucked away by Tartuffe. So what we wanted to do from a practical point of view is we wanted to have one costume that was transformable. So you'll see in my sketch in the middle that at the beginning of the show, the underskirt is exposed and there you may not be able to make it out, but there are these little grape motifs on the stomacher, which is that triangular V-shaped piece that's on the bodice of the dress. And then we just simply close the skirt and swap out the stomacher for a gray stomacher. And you will see on the other side of the screen, you're going to see the gray version of the dress. And let's just slip to the next slide now. Thank you, Natalie. The next slide is going to show us this one. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. You see the um, you see the sketch for Tartuffe on the side, and then you'll also see the real um, the real actualized costume for Tartuffe. And he comes to the family as a beggar. He is he is low. He is dirty. He has no power. And Almir, as the mistress of the house, has all the power and Oregon, her husband, has all the power. Let's slip to the next slide then and we'll just take a look at her transformation. There is a section in the play where Elmir is in some ways I would say stripped bare and the way that we showed this is she has lost her overskirt. It's a really disturbing scene between Elmir and Tartuffe her husband, Orgon, is actually hiding behind her right now. And what you're seeing here with her hoop skirt and her petticoat, it's a very exposed state. It's something that probably even her husband would not normally see. And then when we see Elmir on the other side of the slide in her gray outfit, you can really see that she is no longer the one who holds the cards. She is no longer the one who holds the power. And in the next slide, we are going to see where that power went. And I'm betting that you already know. Just to remind you, the early sketch of Tartuffe on one side of the screen, the other side of the screen is Tartuffe as he has taken all of the power from that household. And in the middle, you see the triumphant Tartuffe who has uh, 
basically sucked all of the power and the wealth and the goodness away from that family. So that's an example of what I'm talking about when I'm looking at transformation. Let's take a look at the next slide and we'll see what comes next. Set and costumes, overarching design concepts. For me, the most interesting plays to work on are plays where there's this really beautiful rapport between all of the elements. And this uh, production called Good Woman, Good Person of Szechuan by Bertolt Brecht was directed by Myrna Wyatt Selkirk. And there was this lovely, lovely collaboration between Corin, Keith and myself and all of our students. So this, you can see it's a very stylized, uh, stylized version of a village and we'll just go to the next slide and in the next slide we're going to see uh, some other costumes as well as a bit of the village so <laughs> one of the actors you may or may not notice is wearing an orange satin leopard skin print dress now in a normal regular average run-of-the-mill show that would really scream and be loud but in a play like this, where we've already set the two tone, where things are stylized and imaginative, it just fits right in as just a normal sort of day dress. So you can see how um, when one uh, aspect of costumes or set or lights goes big, everybody's got to go big. Let's take a look at the next one. And in the next slide, uh, again, you're going to see that we're using colors that you would normally kind of shy away from with the bright oranges and the bright yellows. And we even have a, a funny little construct where um, the gentleman on one side is replaced sometimes when he's not available because the actor is playing another role. He's replaced by this kind of stuffed teddy on a mannequin. And it's totally fine because it's the kind of show and Brecht often lends himself to this where we can be stylized, we can be imaginative, we don't need to pretend that things are real. And let's just look at the last slide for this section. It's not the last slide of the presentation, but just for this section. Even within a show like this, where it's very stylized, there still needs to be moments that are quiet, reflective moments. And I think of it as just giving that moment to hear the actor's voice, to hear the words that are in the script, and just genuinely, quietly focus on that. So even in a big show with the bright and the light and all of that, there are still moments for a black jacket and some dark pants, because this is a, a quiet, sentimental moment. So within a costume design, there needs to be those sort of moments where you can breathe, moments, moments that excite, moments that thrill, but also moments that are the quiet moments that respect that arc of the play. Let's take a look at the next slide. And we're getting into things that I think are really exciting. I call this defined by light. And we'll go straight to the next slide with this one. This one is Richard III by William Shakespeare, of course, and directed by Myrna Wyatt Selkirk. I call this the dark circus defined by light. And colleague, uh, very dear colleague, Keith Roach, who anyone knows him knows he is the salt of the earth, a lovely man. Um, Keith designed this, uh, this lighting palette that was just so, it's both bold and dark at the same time. And with the smoke and atmosphere here, you can see that this is a, a photo that I'm showing you where you can't even really see the costumes and it does not matter to me because this whole image is it, it, it lives and breathes because of the way that it's been lit. Now let's take a look at a few more slides of this same Richard III. And here we are, thank you. And um, you can see that the director, Myrna Wyatt Selkirk, has, she has a really playful sense of a sense of humor as well as a playful sense of the way to direct. So when Myrna said she wanted a dark circus, 
we completely embrace that. So you can see that that idea of the dark circus brings its way into both the makeup design as well as the costume design. As you see that little ruff that's echoing and making a little nod to the Elizabethan ruff, but it's also a kind of modern, modern twisted version of it made out of playing cards. I thought that was a beautiful design on my students' part. And let's look at the next one. And here again, we're seeing that idea of that the brightness of the costumes, but completely um, recontextualized by the intensity and the darkness of the light. And we'll look at the next one as well. The next one is um, the three Richards. And I had mentioned to you before that Myrna sometimes triples characters. So there were three Richard the thirds and those uh, cod piece wearing uh, jester like characters are the three Richards. And you can see that um, the sort of idea of a, of a jester and the cod pieces and the makeup and even the sort of Harlequin party colors, all of these things are kind of making a nod to an Elizabethan beginning, a little Elizabethan roots of the script, of Shakespeare's script, but we've completely taken that and turned it on its head. So it was a super fun show to work on. Let's look at what's coming up next. Costumous sculpture. I can tell you as we skip to the next slide, that um, the idea of creating sculptural elements with costumes is really exciting to me. Um, in this play called A History of Breathing, and it's by Daniel McDonald, this was directed again by Myrna Wyatt Selkirk. We've created these costumes that um, just the very shape of them, it's not in harmony with the actor's own body, it actually, gives them this sort of extension and enlargement. And it allows the actor to move in a completely different way and kind of recreate their own sensibilities as they are playing muskrat, toad, and turtle. And let's take a look at the next slide. Funnily, the next slide is one of the more difficult costumes that we made, and you would not, you would not think so as you look at it. The, the standing character is portraying water, and it's a character that wasn't written into the script, but Myrna added in two actors to play water. And you can see that as the actor is moving and swooshing and, and sort of moving through space, they're creating this sculptural element that changes with every movement, with every breath, their, their sort of physical manifestation in space is changing. I thought it was the most beautiful, beautiful thing. And I can tell you that it took us a few tries to get this costume. My students were very, very diligent. We tried three different methods of making this costume, and we finally settled on this one. It is basically bits of lining and cheesecloth. So there's nothing special going on here. It's not silk that we, you know, silk that we imported or anything like that. But it was a matter of getting the right textures, the right materials that would float in the air and that would create this image. Let's look at our next tricks. And I think this is probably my last trick that I have for you today. And it's about creating movement. And we'll skip to the next slide for this one. There is, um, this may or may not play as a video. Um, I can tell you what it is. If it does play, that'll be fun. But if not, it's really okay too. Oh, look at it, it's playing, there you go. So this is, this is Eve, who is um, in his very first fitting with this eagle costume. And we're just testing it out to see if it actually moves and flaps. And it turns out that it did. And if you were to hear the soundtrack, you'd hear me giggling because I was so excited that the costume actually worked. And now we'll slip to the next slide. And here is the image of the eagle with the lights in its full glory. And we can go through a couple more slides. 
And um, we'll just see that it was really important for me that the actor be able to move very well. And in the next slide, we're also going to see that um, he can be big as well as be small. He can have those quiet moments as well as the sort of big grand gestures. And we'll go to the next slide, which I believe is our very last slide. Um, this, <laughs> before I turn it over to questions, I just want to mention that this costume was also from the birds uh, that was adapted, written, adapted, and directed by Yvette Nolan. And it was an absolute pleasure to work with her. So now I'm happy to turn this over to questions. I hope that you had, um, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, feel free to send a question into the chat and someone is gonna relay the questions to me. So thanks everybody. I'll have Thanks so much, Catherine. This is Aaron back. Um, hey, Aaron. Nice to see that you. That was fascinating as always. And I just wanted to remark on um, the how innovative the costuming that you showed us is and how perfectly, again, that fits with our with our theme. Um, we do have a first question from uh, our audience uh, asking whether you archive the costumes or production documentation, drawings, photographs, sketches. That is a great question. And I would say is an aspirational question. <laughs> <laughs> this semester, we've actually taken it on as a project that we are collecting together all of the photographs from all of our past shows. And we're trying to put together an actual digital archive that will be accessible. So it's an aspirational yes that I give you on that. At the present moment, the archive is Catherine has boxes. <laughs> but we aim to do better. <laughs> well, we're glad you keep the boxes because they make these presentations possible, among other things. Um, so connected to this is a question about uh, the digital. So this yep. maybe speaks to your past projects as well. So the question is, with the widely held ability to do amazing things digitally, do you find the impact of costuming and lighting in live theatre has been diminished? In other words, our audience is jaded, right? You talked about some principles of contrast there where we need moments to breathe, but also moments of thrill. Has the digital interfered at all in that kind of theatrical experience that costuming can provide? Right, right. That's an excellent question. I don't think so, but I'm probably not the one to answer it. I think the audience would be the one to <laughs> So I guess I'm sidestepping that one. I, I don't know. I don't Fair know. Enough. That's okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> building on the, the, the question of sort of composition, right, um, or visual storytelling. So, for example, yes. you were talking about, uh, so one principle of composition being contrast, right? So yes. moments to breathe, moments for thrill, the children of the light versus the children of the dark. Um, one person asks how you work with texture. Do you consider texture when creating a, a costume as another compositional element of your creative yes. practice? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you to that lovely person who mentioned texture. Yes, texture is super important and it's the it's it's just another way to uh, define different characters. We try to make sure that we never use just a flat, flat fabric, whether it's mm -hmm. a present, you want it to be like good and chewy and chewy and juicy and have lots of texture to it, whether it's someone royal that might have contrasts of, we use fake fur, um, so contrasts of a, the ermine tails made out of fun fur and the, and the white fur, and then contrast that with some satin and some velvet. So yes, mm -hmm. we to get those textures in there. And whether it's textures that are reflective or whether they absorb light, we just kind of embrace them. So yes, that was a, that was a person who knows what they're asking about. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So a follow up to that is where do you get these juicy materials, the, the, <laughs> the, the tasty fabrics that you work with? Someone wants to know how you source oh, them. Yeah. And yes, there's also yeah. a question about budgeting, which might 
be related? Yes. Okay, so I can tell you my answer from 15 years ago, which was mm -hmm. we go on St. Joubert Street and we buy it with money. And my answer from today is um, we do a lot of, um, we do the Scarlet O'Hare fruit. <laughs> I honestly have, um, I have a closet full of curtains. We've got boxes of leftovers from different shows and we absolutely start with what have we got in stock? And then we get out dyes and we, it, it, there was one of the fabrics, it was a striped fabric that uh, one of the men was wearing in Richard the third. One of my students actually took blue fabrics and red fabrics, spandex and sewed them together to make the stripe. So they come out of nowhere. And it, yes, like if I can, I go to St. Hubert Street in Montreal and I buy fabrics, but when in doubt, go to the closet. So, and I encourage others to go to the closet as well and, and use what you got. Because in the end, sometimes it feels like we have a lot. And I almost now don't know why I used to just go and say, here, take our money. Well, we had money. <laughs> we had money to take. And, you know, I think McGill is definitely not alone in terms of uh, budgets that are getting smaller and smaller. I think it's, it's a reality that all theaters are facing. And in some weird way, I'm happy for that challenge because I like the fact that we're not wasting. I like the fact that we're actually making use of what we've got. And then we can spend the money on things like shoes that we can't make. Mm. <laughs> so that's the scoop. Well, you've precociously answered the next question, which was about recycling costumes in other performances. So the short answer is yes. And you've just heard Catherine elaborate yep. a bit on that. Uh, it's yep. part of the innovation of what she does is seeing something in a previous costume that can be used for a future one, right? It's repurposing. Um, yes. Another question, what is the role of costume design in an academic institution? What are some of the differences between what you do at McGill and what studi other studios do for theater production houses? Certainly mm. that's true. We are not an actor training program. And I think it, it's interesting. Um, our drama and theater program lives within the uh, rubric of the English department, three streams. So I think for us, Part of it is the script, as I had mentioned before. Um, other than that, you know, I think that we approach things in pretty much the same way. We really, we want to make the best possible costumes we can. Um, we want our actors to really feel, um, feel that change of when you wear a costume, you feel different. Um, mm. In that sense, I'm not sure that we do things differently than uh, places that are more out training programs. Maybe our resources are a little bit less. We have less mm -hmm. staff, but we try to, we're like those armies in the opera where we try to pretend that we're more people than we really are. And sometimes it works pretty much of the time. And I can say my colleagues have to pretend to be more people than they really are uh, often <laughs> in set and lighting and and all of that too. Right. You were speaking about transformation in your talk and there's a question from one of the students in intro to theater studies about that, or I think that's related to that. Um, and they ask, are costumes or the costume try on day, the most exciting day for the student actors? I think that they there's really, a lot of excitement. I think they really like them. And an interesting comment that I've had from actors that I find quite touching is they'll say, oh, okay, now I feel the character. When they put mm -hmm. the costume on, that's when it's like that final piece in the puzzle comes together. So yeah, I think it's pretty exciting. And we also get people going, that guy had his costume already. How come mine isn't ready? <laughs> so that makes me think that yes, people are kind of excited about it. <laughs> I, I've yeah. seen it too on the other end, that excitement, yes, going into your shop for sure and coming out of it. Um, so we have another question about sources, where, where you source and how you source material, but this is slightly different, it's canted slightly differently. Yes. Do you source different textiles for historical costume pieces? 
In other words, is that a different kind yes. of fabric that you're looking for? Yes, absolutely. When making historical costumes or period costumes, we try to use fabrics that at least, well, if possible, that they're natural fibers. And if not possible, then at least they look like natural fibers because they are going to hang differently. They also dye differently. They reflect the light term. Mm -hmm. so as much as possible, we try to avoid synthetics when we're sourcing period costumes. So wise question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so here's a question about uh, related to your discussion of process. So you took us through your design process from and sort of text to stage or page to stage, right? Um, so one person asks, what's the average time frame for you to go through this creative process? And maybe you could answer that question in terms of productions at McGill that you work on and maybe professional pro productions that you work on or have worked on. Sure. Um, it's nice to have two months. <laughs> Sometimes you don't. Um, production of more like one month and there's a difference as well between uh in quebec we have a really kind of a rich heritage francophone theater companies operate in a different timeline they will actually kind of workshop a play for a longer period of time like maybe even three months four months six months um and the designer will be part of that process um, Anglophone theatres in Montreal are a little more similar to other English speaking countries where we have a bit shorter timeline. Sometimes you're kind of in the three weeks turnaround time when it's more of a commercial house that you're working in. I very much prefer the go long and go steady approach, which two months gives us about that time. Thank you. Um, someone wants to know how you got into this, and then we'll follow up that question with a question from a nine-year-old in our audience. So I'm going to leave you hanging okay. on that one. Tell okay. us about your parcours. Okay, I got into it by accident. I wasn't planning to do this. <laughs> I was. St I studied fashion design at Ryerson. I got really good training in pattern making, sewing. I even learned my millinery skills there, and. A friend of mine was working at the Stratford Festival for the summer and she said, Catherine, you should come. You'd like it. So I went in that kind of like, well, it's my summer after university. I might as well just go and, you know, do a little fun thing and then come back to my real life. And the problem was that I forgot to come back to real life. And about five years in working in theater, I went, oh, I guess this is what I do. And uh, I have only worked in theatre since graduating. Well, theatre, sometimes movies, sometimes television, but theatre is my heart. And uh, it's now been 30 plus years and I stopped thinking that I needed to get back to my real life. And I embrace this as my life and I really appreciate it and I love it. Thanks, Catherine. We have just before we take the question from the nine year old, there's a comment yes. in the chat um, who says that uh, the person says that you're a magician at creating the desired effect or <laughs> getting the messages necessary within a play, especially within the budgetary constraints. Um, so they just wanted to highlight your um, your particular talents there and which is amazingly uh, useful and indeed necessary when you're working in the theater, especially these days, right? Where I just are tight across the board anymore. It's the team. It is entirely the team. And there are times when I'm just the one going, hey, what if we try this? And, you know, it's it's my team. So thank yeah. you for that. I think we all want a Catherine Bradley team t-shirt, actually. <laughs> that will be the next swag that we that we sell to say fundraise. No. I say no. <laughs> okay. Bring so the, the nine-year-old. We want Yes, the question for the nine-year-old. Um, I'm nine years old and I'm very interested in costumes. If you were making costumes for a play like Hamilton, which is about a different time, but set with modern music, how would you mix the modern with the with the past, with the setting? 
oh, nine-year-old, you have asked the trickiest question that anyone has asked all night. It's a question I ask myself a lot because directors often want to do something where they'll say, oh, a little period flavor, but um, in a modern context. It's the trickiest thing. And every time I hear that, I, I kind of go, Oh, okay. And what I do is I go back to period lines and silhouettes. What does the shape look like? And then mm -hmm. I kind of do a modern spin on it and hope for the best mm -hmm. because it's one of the trickiest, trickiest things. The nine year old is the wise one. So thank you. Thank you for being so wise. As usual, ain't that the way? So we have time for about probably one or two more questions. Uh, people are chiming in, they want the Team Bradley t-shirt, just FYI. Um, so this question arises from, I think what you were talking about, um, the, the color palette and then, oh, color coding the teams. Yeah. So the question is, um, do you start making the costumes in the order of the roles of importance, such that, for example, secondary roles, mesh with or are defined via the primary roles? No. But you're and dividing the world of the play otherwise. Are you talking about, do I start with the design of the primary roles first? Yes, that's the question. Uh, no, no, no. I would say what where we start is by looking at what the silhouette should be, what the era should be, what our overarching design concepts are. And then it's almost like laying down big color blocks. Um, so it, it all gets built up at the same time, because if you're on stage as an actor, we're going to see you. So nothing can look out of place. Uh, I think that every actor who's on stage should feel like they're wearing something great. And yes, mm. for sure, if there are actors who are playing multiple roles and they'll be on for 30 seconds as the maid and then 40 seconds as the flower seller, those costumes I'll probably pull from costume storage. I will hope to, um, just so that we can maximize our time making the costumes that we'll see the most. Okay, that's kind of my strategy. Thanks. That's helpful. Yeah. We have one minute before the thank you. I just want to invite you to speak to the courses you're offering because a lot of the students are asking when can they take a course with you and what do you offer? So it's the first a general interest course in costume and then the costume design courses. Okay, so that's that's very sweet. Thank you. I costuming for theater one in the fall normally, costuming for the theater two in the winter and I teach history of costume in the fall um, and just get in touch with me. And I also just want to make a little shout out to say if there's anyone who has a question for me that you'd like me to answer, uh, Catherine.bradley at mcgill.ca and I would love to answer your question. And I see Natalie Cook's face, so I think it's time for something else. <laughs> You know what, Catherine and Erin, this was absolutely magical. This was really, really terrific. What a, an amazing job to be working with the Rare and Special Collections and be able to have a platform to have colleagues and friends like you show off your talent and your insight. Thanks so much. And thank you so much. I expect people in the audience know how the theatre works. And you may have noticed that this was all about team. Did you notice the PowerPoints that were coming up? in successive waves as the various PowerPoints crashed. So thank you to our production team, Hannah Deskin, Michelle McLeod, and Jacqueline Sundberg, who are artists in their own right, working in the area or the worlds of puppetry, of photography, of costume design, and also music. Um, two other thank yous. One is to all of you for coming. The other is to the Social Sciences and Research Council of Canada and private sponsors also interested in theater in particular, Ron Harvey and Doug Bagley for making this series popular. And I'd like to let you know about the upcoming event, which I think might interest you. It's a talk by Kelsey Blair on performance play and female empowerment. Kelsey is actually an award-winning basketball player and in her postdoctoral research looks at um, sports and specifically basketball from the perspective of dance and performance. That's going to be on October the 6th 
um, also at five o'clock. Until then, stay well, enjoy performance, and thank you so much to everybody. <laughs>